And actually, so the one last question just about this before we move to GameStop, Raul, you did tweet that you thought ETH might well, and I'm quoting here, might well go to $20,000 this cycle. Are you still standing by that? It's all I did, no magic. I took the chart from a million wallets and a million wallets in Bitcoin. And where did it go? It went to 20,000. So I'm like, okay, that's a good enough guess. Does it hit that? Does it not hit that? Irrelevant. What it means, what I'm really trying to say, and something like that is it's much larger than you think. And we've got some idea of a, an event that played out in the past that looks very like this. And, you know, people like me love a bit of a historical chart pattern, even though I said this whole new space is exciting. But when you've got something that's so highly correlated, it's like, okay, this is interesting. That sounds a sensible target. Um, and I know it sounds nonsensical to many, but because nobody can think in exponential terms, we're just incapable as humans to think. I just spoke to, as I said, I spoke to Mark Yusko earlier. He said, and he had a great, and again, I don't know if his maths is dead right, but just take it as roughly. He said, I can walk 20 paces and go across my office. Linear paces. If I take 20 exponential paces, I go around the world three times. That's right. why we cannot wow. think in exponential terms. It's hilarious. Humans just can't do it because we don't think that way. Uh, yeah, that, that, so, I like that. That's a great quote. And so but Lynn, whether Mark's maths is right or not, <laughs> uh, I don't know. But, you know hmm, be, maybe I'll try to find somebody to fact check that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm sure we can find something. <laughs> That's like, Jeff, that's like that's like a Jeff Booth's thing where he always points out that if you fold a paper 50 times, you know, if you ask people how big do you think it is and people say, I don't know, like three feet, and you're like, no, it's to the sun. Like it's, <laughs> and after like fold 37, like you're already to the moon. Like it's, it, the math gets silly once you get out far enough. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So Lynn, what would be your price prediction for ETH by end of year? I don't have a strong opinion on that, but, um, you know, I, I think that, that, cause the concern is if you, if you, we're watching in 2017, you gave a price prediction on any of them in early 2017, they probably would have all undershot what happened in 2017. <laughs> and so, uh, but I do, I, I think Rao's approach or just kind of looking at, at historical uh, you know, price and seeing what happens, I think makes sense. And it's, it's part of the reason why I got so bullish on, on Bitcoin about a year ago is because I said, look, every time there's a halving, uh, this happens. And so I'd rather take the bet as as a you know a certain allocation because even though I don't have a specific price target, it's almost like you're embarrassed to say what you think the actual price target is. You're like, you know, if it's if it's sitting in there at like seven thousand, you want to be like, I think it might go to a hundred thousand, you know. But like, as it was like, so even then when I kind of made my Bitcoin argument, I didn't give a price target other than I thought it's it's well north of here, and I kind of gave like a really big range of outcomes that like starts at like thirty thousand and it, it it goes up from there, and so. I kind of view Ethereum the same way, where if if this is a good year for Bitcoin, I would expect Ethereum to to also have a very good year, and you know, in all likelihood, probably outperform during the bull market of that phase. I wouldn't be surprised. And hmm. so I I don't really know where the 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 end of the year looks like. I just think it's it's probably north of here by, you know, probably a notable amount if I were to guess. Okay. Yeah. And again, right. I, I'd use exactly this the same way. We look again. None of us know. Exponential assets are really hard. Not any of us, not a single person on earth would have guessed how big Amazon got or its share price. None of us would. Right. So we're going to undershoot some years and we're going to wildly overshoot other years trying to figure <laughs> this stuff out. And again, who knows? All right. Let's talk GameStop. I just want to hear kind of what your main thoughts are around everything that happened. And either of you can go first. I'm actually more on the fence about it than than many. It got all the tribes up with the hackles out. I love the democratization of financial information trading. I love the fact that people are now not going, you know, we started Real Vision for this exact purpose, the democratization of information. You don't give it to a wealth advisor who you barely meet once a year. He takes all your life savings and at the end of it, you get an outcome. It's, it's madness. So people are now taking an active involvement. It took a while for the millennials to do that because they had a lot of debts, but now they're in it. Whether it's stimulus checks or not, it doesn't matter. It's great. It's great to see. And people like, it's, you know, David against Goliath. Well, they're actually just doing what everybody else in financial markets does. I mean, hedge funds will look for every single short position. If they think somebody's really crowded short, a bunch of them will get together and try and squeeze the other one out. That's financial markets. That's how it works. That's how you try and extract value. Um, so... You know, I think a lot of that was normal. I think Robin Hood 
went about everything in a unfortunately ugly manner. Firstly, most people didn't realize, and you know, any of us who've been in markets for a while knew that if the product's free, you're you're the product. And that will be the same with the new strike network as well. You know, don't forget there's a bunch of FX transactions in the middle of that. Somebody gets paid. So in this, you've got that whole Robin Hood, them, the millennials not realizing it, because many of them still don't really realize with Facebook that they were the or, or Instagram that they were the product. Um, so there's that learning, but and Robin Hood also didn't have enough capital. That was the, actually the issue for the amount of margin trades that went through. So when volatility went so extreme because of so much retail option activity, everybody got tapped on the shoulder. But people like interactive brokers had plenty of capital. They had 10 billion of capital, but Robin Hood didn't. And that in, is where lies the problem because they created their own settlement system internally to net off trades. And that's what created the problems. So outside of the philosophical battle of David and Goliath and the democratization and people against the hedge funds and are the hedge funds crooks, all of this stuff, it's actually a story of broken financial plumbing. So what you're um, saying is that if Robin Hood had outsourced that function, then most likely that third party would have been able to put up enough margin collateral? For my, my guess, and I don't know, is the reason they have their own netting off internal clearing is it lowers margin. So, mm -hmm. which is why prime brokers use hedge, um, hedge funds use prime brokers for a similar reason, because you net off. So they netted off, so they didn't have to post as much margin, so they have more free capital in the business. Um, so what happens in times of stress, they didn't realize that this is what happens. But the actual issue is here, you know, within the story is the story that short position potentially was larger than the entire market cap, whether that was actually the case or not, I'm not sure. But it's the story of plumbing. What actually went wrong is the plumbing blew up. Well, so, and so Lynn, I do want to hear your thoughts, but I actually just want to ask Raul, because um, I was trying to figure out you know, when I was looking at all that, you know, obviously I also spend my time looking at DeFi where a lot of things are over collateralized. And then when people don't, you know, that they, they can get liquidated when they're, when the value of their collateral falls belief, below, you know, what they've, or the ratio of what they've borrowed. So, you know, I was just trying to figure out, well, would any kind of smart contract like that solve this issue or not solve, but prevent it where, you know, instead of just a blanket, nobody can buy anymore than like individuals maybe that don't have enough collateral will, you know, not be able to do something. But firstly, to have stopped the leverage on the hedge fund side, which was extreme and on the option trading side by individuals. Again, a lot of this could have gone on blockchain technology. So at the core of the custody system, which is the DTCC is where some of this problem had evolved and who owns what in a situation where there are more short sellers than there is market cap, if that was the case, none of that should have happened. It's because there's no recorded ownership at a trusted right. level. We saw that with Gold Foods. We've seen this on numerous occasions with Lehman Brothers and the 32 times re of certain assets. So all of this is the big mess that, that when I first saw Bitcoin, I realized that actually the blockchain is an answer to so much of this to verify transactions and all of that. In terms of smart contracts, without question, can you build in auto margin liquidation? Right now, what happens is you get margin called, you get an email and then a phone call, and then you have to make post margin and then they might liquidate your trade, right? This is nonsense. And I lost money in MF Global, which is one of the blow ups in this kind of thing. And I tried to pull my money out, I couldn't. None of this should really happen. Most of this should be just an algorithm. Yeah. Um, one other thing that I was going to say, oh, um, so Caitlin Long also always, I mean, long before the Robin Hood thing has talked about the ability for companies to, or, or for investors to buy more shorts than there are even existing shares. And so I saw also Senator Cynthia Lummis, the new Bitcoin supporter in Congress, also tweeted about it. And now she's on the banking committee. So who knows what we'll see with that. Um, but yeah, in this case, the hedge funds had shorted 130 36% of GameStop, which, you know, obviously if they were to try to cover the shorts, they wouldn't even be able to buy all, uh, enough shares. So, you see, um, and, and the problem is, again, I spent a long time on this because I almost went after 2012 when Europe almost went under, almost tried to 
set up the world's safest bank with a group of investors. And then I discovered Bitcoin and realized there was probably a better solution. I had the DTCC, Euroclear, the New York Fed, um, and I'd spoken to the ECB about settlement, right, custody. What almost happened in Europe and what almost happened, why, why AIG was not able to go bust, but Lehman was, was because one was a AAA collateral and they were 32 times rehypothecated by the system. Oh. Hmm. So there was 32 claims on that one bond. Now, when Lehman went under, the ECB injected $50 billion quickly into Euroclear, which is a custody entity. And what Euroclear did was pledge collateral to the ECB for the loan, normal. I found this book and there is the collateral, the customer positions, because there is no segregation of customers at central Euroclear level. So then I went to the DTCC and there's a whole bunch of us were there with the New York Fed. And we said, hey, listen, guys, is there segregation? And they said, of course, everybody's segregated. I said, okay, let's say one of the counterparts, let's say JP Morgan goes bust or a collateral. Let's say UK guilds go bust and somebody's pledged them as collateral. What happens? Well, if, there's, if nobody can figure this out, we'll, inject, we'll, we'll lend money to the DCCC. We can't let them go bust. I said, great, what are you going to take? And they said, collateral. I said, what's the collateral? And they said, well, whatever they give us. I said, this is customer positions and it's non-segregated at this point. They went, yes. So what it means is at the very core, nobody's protected from anything. And the system overuses assets. And we can overuse assets fine as long as we have a chain of who owns what at what point. But in this situation, you have no idea because then there's a der derivative layer on top. And this is why this whole problem is much larger than this Robin Hood story. It's actually the problem of a system that's not able to cope with the amount of leverage that's within it and claims on it. Right. Like simply just the, it's like a lack of visibility. So in that sense, the fact that blockchains can make the data transparent is, is actually literally pretty much the major advantage. Is that it? Trusted ownership. It's the basic essence of the blockchain is a verified trusted owner, ownership structure. That's what it gives. And we don't have that in the securities market at all. You don't have it as a brokerage customer. You don't have it as a brokerage house. You don't have it as a cust clearing entity. You don't have it as a custody entity. You don't have it as a bank. Nobody has trusted ownership of anything, which is why people store gold in a gold vault. And you have to make sure that the paperwork says that they cannot reuse it because you can put it in a gold vault and they can still reuse it. Uh. It's extraordinary well. Bitcoin, I own my Bitcoin. It's in my name.